Okay, everybody, it's time for chapter 27, The Age of Expansion and Imperialism. So this picture perfectly depicts the attitude of America during the Age of Imperialism, which is looking at these smaller countries around the world, not as sovereign nations, individual and free, but rather, uh, I guess you could say, uh, a dish to be ordered, something for us to be consumed, and new territory for us to gain. So why does America turn its attention outward? A lot of it has to do with the economic growth that our nation was seeing. We wanted new markets to spread our uh, economic growth into uh, so that we could sell our goods and our booming industry would have more places to make money. It also would relieve labor pressure off of our nation and allow for more jobs to be created. Uh, more people who were moving to or living in America would then have places to live and work. Uh, you also have people who were being missionaries. In fact, one of the first times we reached out to other nations was to Hawaii uh, in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. And so uh, Christianizing other nations and spreading the gospel was a big idea there as well. And then you have the influence of sea power upon history written by one Alfred T. Mahan, or Mahan, depending on which person you're listening to. He, what he said is that America needed to build a powerful navy because in history, uh, nations that were powerful had powerful navies. His examples were Netherlands, which was a, a worldwide economic powerhouse, as well as Britain, which used its navy to control a massive empire. Some would say that the sun never set on the British Empire. That's because despite being a small island, uh, the sun was, was in fact always shining on land they owned across the world. And finally, you also have America wanting to be the, quote, big sister as Secretary of State James Lane pushed. The idea was that Latin American nations would be places where we would have some sphere of control over their people and we would be able to sell their products. We could move there, but most of all, we could just gain profits off of them. And then finally, of Britain considering war against, when, when Britain considered war against Venezuela, we were able to convince them to back off because we threatened intervention. Eventually, as we'll see, under Teddy Roosevelt, we will also buy their debts, which is why Britain wanted to, to fight world war against them, uh, and we will clear the way for us to be the main leaders. So one of the first areas that we see America practice imperialism is, in fact, Hawaii, where we have missionaries arriving in the early 1800s. U.S. even developed such a strong relationship that we tell other nations to stay away. The problem is, is over time, this friendly relationship turned into more of an economic relationship, with U.S. planters investing in and purchasing lots of plantations in Hawaii to grow sugar. By 1887, Hawaii had granted naval base rights at Pearl Harbor to the United States. The problem is, is this relationship turned a little bit sour when the McKinley Tariff was passed in 1890. Because this damaged sugar profits, uh, with Hawaii being a foreign nation, this tariff charged large taxes on those imports. And so U.S. planters decided to take over Hawaii and force the annexation of those islands. Although the Queen Lilio Kalani fought against this annexation, she was put under house arrest as the military took it over. Grover Cleveland, president at the time, he said that the native people there uh, did not want to be part of the United States, so he refused to annex it. However, once his presidency was over, he was, uh, well, William McKinley will quickly annex Hawaii and make it a state. So this map shows just all the different areas that America was involved in in the age of imperialism, uh, really spreading our wings across the world and making sure that we are a world power and not just a Western Hemisphere regional power. So beyond this, we also end up picking a fight with Spain to not only spread our wings, but also to test just how strong our military could be. Could we exert our power over uh, European nations that previously had been well, qu quite dominant over the United States and the Western Hemisphere? So the Spanish-American War is brought about for these specific reasons. Number one, you have the Spanish mistreatment of the Cubans who lived there. Uh, the Cubans had wanted their independence and Spain refused to give it to them and so Cubans began to rebel. This caused the Spanish to begin putting Cuban insurrectionists into concentration camps. So after the insurrection is being put down and handled, the insurrectionists decide that they need to get the U.S. attention or the attention of the U.S. And so what they end up doing is burning down many of the sugar plantations that existed on the island. And with American economic interest being destroyed, this is the Gilded Age after all, businessmen in America began pushing the American government to intervene to save their investments. Then you have yellow journalism. As we touched on in the last chapter, Hearst and Pulitzer enraged Americans by printing sensational stories. And many of them were way over the top and obviously false, but it didn't matter because it sold newspapers for them and also ignited anger in Americans, which will eventually push us to war. The final tipping point is the explosion of the USS Maine. When the U.S. ship was docked, uh, it was docked there just in case war broke out and American 
citizens needed to flee Cuba, um, unfortunately just suddenly exploded. And when it exploded, uh, that led America to quickly declare war on Spain because we believed they had done it. Now, future scientific studies will find that the USS Maine actually had spontaneous combustion. It had nothing to do with the Spanish or anybody else. Just a horrible accident. But that didn't stop us from declaring war. Now, it says there McKinley reluctantly declared war, but America was quite excited about it. That also brings us to one good step America takes, which is uh, passing the Teller Amendment in Congress that guaranteed that even though we're fighting this war for Cuba against Spain, we're not allowed to take it. And so we guaranteed Cuban independence after the war. This brings us to the, quote, splendid little war. As you can see on this slide, the war only lasted from May to August, which tells you a couple of things, both that Spain was very weak compared to how it used to be, and that America had truly ascended into a world power. The U.S. Navy launched an attack not on Cuba and not on the surrounding islands, but the first place we attack is the Philippines. The Philippines uh, were a Spanish possession, and they were completely surprised uh, when the Americans roll up and attack them. They had thought that they were not going to be attacked because, after all, they're all the way around the world. So America quickly captures the Philippines, and we also begin invading Cuba just after it. The Spanish Navy quickly blockaded, or was quickly blockaded into the Santiago Harbor, which brought us to Theodore Roosevelt leading his Rough Riders to capture those hills looking over that Santiago Harbor. So once the harbor is uh, captured and protected, the Spanish uh, ships are forced to uh, uh, face the American Navy, and they are quickly and uh, swiftly defeated. So after their uh, fleet was defeated, the U.S. also captured Puerto Rico before Spain could surrender, which means that they also had to give up that island to us as well. And so an armistice is called on August 12, 1898, and this splendid little war is over. So um, that's just a map of how the battles went, and this is the wonderful Rough Riders that Teddy Roosevelt led, and of course Uncle Sam's latest, greatest, shortest war. Nice depiction there. Uncle Sam looks pretty angry. So America's course or curse of empire. So the U.S. secures many different islands, but we're torn over exactly what to do with them, especially the Philippines. Why did we take the Philippines? Well, we just wanted to spread our wings and take more territory over. Despite the debate over it, uh, McKinley decides to annex the Philippines. Uh, Manila was captured after the treaty was signed, and so Spain received $20 million for losing that territory. Uh, regardless in America, although we did annex it, many people believed that we should not have done so. Expansionists said that we had the responsibility to help these underprivileged people, but others said things like, this is going to hurt our labor force. And Jane Addams says things to the effect of, hey, uh, this is completely immoral and unfair. And Grover Cleveland, well, he had stopped us from annexing Hawaii so quickly against their will. Of course, he stands in the way of quickly annexing Philippines as well, or annexing it at all because they simply did not want us there. And so this group known as the Anti-Imperialistic League fought against the expansion and annexation of this territory. Other er other issues exist, including uh, what do we do with Puerto Rico? We give them a limited popular government with the Four Acre Act, and eventually we grant them citizenship. And the insular cases, however, the Supreme Court says that our Constitution, and thus the uh, constitutional rights, don't extend to the Philippines and Puerto Rico, even after we give them that citizenship. Uh, Cuba also is forced to write a new constitution. Even though they were independent, the Platt Amendment allowed the U.S. to intervene if things did not go well. And ladies and gentlemen, we did in fact intervene several times, as we'll cover through the next few chapters. And then you have the very derogatory uh, look towards the Philippines. We called them our little brown brothers. In 1899, uh, the, the Filipinos rebel, but they are, uh, they are forced to accept their annexation and control uh, after their leader, Emilio Aguinaldo, was captured. McKinley created the Philippine Commission to supposedly benevolent, as, benevolently assimilate the Philippines into our country. Now, you'll notice the word assimilation is the same word we use when we talk about Native Americans. That's very much the same approach we took towards the Philippines. Yes, we developed economic ties, improved the infrastructure and education, but we were never welcome there. They didn't want to adapt to our culture, but so America, uh, regardless, takes it over and, well, forces them to... Uh, be brought into the, quote, civilized world. So this brings the moral question. Even though we improve the Philippines, even though we overall probably helped develop them faster than we would have otherwise, is it still a moral thing for us to do to control a nation against their will? And so you can see why a massive debate raged about the annexation of the Philippines and imperialism as a whole. So then you have the open door uh, uh, policy in China. Basically, we had no ties inside of China. And when the Boxer Rebellion failed to kick out all of the foreign powers in China, including Britain and Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Netherlands, 
Uh, so lots of countries were trying to control it, and after they put down that rebellion, they actually wanted to turn it into a bunch of colonies. So John Hay, the Secretary of State at the time, he convinces these nations to respect Chinese economic and territorial integrity, which looks like a good deed from the outside. However, John Hay had a reason behind this open-door policy, and that's because it provided an open door for America to trade with the Chinese there. Uh, if, they had, if it had been colonized, they wouldn't have been nearly as open to American goods and trade. And so the open-door policy is a good thing because China does keep its sovereignty. However, it was for selfish reasons. Regardless, the open door policy is remembered. This brings us to the election of 1900. Uh, in the last couple chapters, we talked about we talked about the populists uh, and how they threw their support behind Bryan with the Democratic Party. And Bryan is selected again, pushing the same issues of bimetallism, and he attacks the immoral imperial acts that the nation had been engaged in. However, you have to understand that there are two things that almost guarantee a presidential victory, and McKinley had both of those when he runs for a second term. The first is winning a war, which everybody seems to love, and also when there is a booming economy, you very, very rarely see a president not get reelected. So with this in mind, Republicans are able to defeat Bryan once again, claiming his economic ideas would undo the economic boom that was already occurring. And so besides that, McKinley had selected Teddy Roosevelt as his vice president. Now in the Progressive Era chapter, we'll talk about why that was a big deal. But for now, just understand that he did not have the same ideas as McKinley, but hey, he's just vice president. He can't do anything, right? Hmm, too bad. Teddy Roosevelt, chosen as the vice president because he had attempted too much reform, they planned to remove him from being able to make these changes because vice presidents can't do anything. Their plan backfired when McKinley was assassinated by Leo, uh, excuse me, Shogolsh, uh, interesting last name, Eastern European, anarchist, if you couldn't guess. And so McKinley, with his death, we have a rubber stamp president who would do whatever Republican leaders wanted him to, replaced by, as your textbook puts it, a locomotive in trousers. He was simply a one-man machine who, whenever he set his mind to something, no one could stop him. So this new type of president, Teddy Roosevelt, as we'll see in the Progressive Era chapter, he was not at all a laissez-faire president. He wanted to use his power to make changes, changes he believed would help the common man and changes that would rein in the big businesses and corruption that he hated so much. Now, critics will claim that he doesn't respect the three branches, checks and balances, and that he greatly exceeds his constitutional authority as president. But I would say for the time period, many people preferred his approach compared to what we had seen in the Gilded Age. But that's for the Progressive Era. For now, let's focus on his uh, uh, foreign policy. So Teddy Roosevelt's motto as far as dealing with other nations is speak softly and carry a big stick. The idea behind this is that America had a powerful navy, a massive military that almost every nation in the world would be afraid to mess with. Why would we not use that size and power to get our way in international affairs? So using this size and power with his big stick diplomacy, also called gunboat diplomacy because it relied on our navy, we controlled the Western Hemisphere. The greatest example is when a canal was being built through Central America. We wanted to build it through Panama, which is the thinnest area of land and the easiest to build it. However, since Colombia, own Panama, they refused to accept the generous offer we gave, at least generous in our minds, and they demanded far more money. When that happened, Teddy Roosevelt met with leaders from Panama, and he decided to support the Panamanian Declaration of Independence. So when Panama declares independence, and Colombia prefers, or, uh, prepares to invade them, Teddy Roosevelt sends the U.S. Navy to the shores as if to say, hey, don't mess with Panama. So Colombia backs off because they knew that fighting Panama would lead to war with America. And so the Panama Canal is built. Now you can understand why people would view that as negative because after all, it is international bullying. However, Teddy Roosevelt would wisely say, in his mind, I saved the world 6,000 nautical miles because otherwise you'd have to go all the way around South America to make it to the West. So while this is a positive change for the world, one has to admit that his aggression did mark a downward turn in our relations with many Latin American countries. He began not to see us as the benevolent country that we feel that we were, rather they look at us as bullies. So Roosevelt also updates the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine had said that Europe would stay out of our affairs. So when Latin American nations like Venezuela began uh, uh, finding themselves massively in debt and unable to pay it back, Roosevelt feared that those nations would be invaded by European countries. So what Teddy Roosevelt does with his Roosevelt Corollary, the addition to the Monroe Doctrine, 
is that he uses, quote, preventive intervention. He buys out all the debt of Latin America so that Europe would leave them alone. The problem is, is well, well, the one positive is that Europe certainly doesn't mind. They gladly give up control of those nations because they get their money that they were looking for. But Latin America found themselves, well, surrounded by the debt collector, the receiver, the sheriff, Teddy Roosevelt with his big stick, forcing them to yield to our authority as they owed us the money now, and we could intervene as we saw fit because of those massive debts. So you can see why the big stick diplomacy is both a good thing as far as building the Panama Canal and helping America exert itself, but unfortunately also a negative thing for many of our smaller neighbors. So this brings us to U.S. and Japanese relations under Teddy Roosevelt. As you can see, Roosevelt was not exactly uh, shy, and so his aggression tended to make some people angry. With that said, he was able to receive the Nobel Peace Prize by brokering peace between Russia and Japan. However, Japan felt like they did not get enough after they had captured lots of territory. So combine that with Japanese immigration uh, finding themselves, or Japanese immigrants, find themselves facing his hostility. Now, you remember in 1882, the Chinese had the Chinese Exclusion Act passed against them, which means that they could not immigrate to America. Unfortunately for Americans and for many, well, uh, I hate to say it, uh, kind of racist people today, they lopped all of those peoples together, including the Koreans, the Chinese, and the Japanese. To the proud Japanese people, this was an absolute insult. And so watching California mistreat their people combined with Roosevelt's inability to give them what they wanted in negotiations, they begin threatening war on America. Which brings us to Roosevelt. What was his response? Was it to apologize? Was it to give in to their pressures? No, in classic Teddy Roosevelt fashion, he takes the new, the brand new fleet that we had, he paints it bright white, which is pretty gaudy, and he sells it around the world. Now, here you can see the path of the Great White Fleet beginning on our East Coast and going around the world, and you'll notice that they decided to make a grand stop in Tokyo to stop in Japan. Now, many people in the world fear that this would cause a war as we're clearly antagonizing them. However, our fleet was actually welcomed in Japan by little Japanese students waving American flags, which is a pretty cute picture. So war ends up being avoided and Roosevelt is actually able to once again negotiate peace called the 1908 Gentlemen's Agreement. Basically, we agreed to kind of back off and not be aggressive. Japan agreed not to threaten war, but we also made an agreement in California that uh, Japanese students would not be forced to go to what they called Oriental schools. In other words, we cut down on the discrimination against Japanese immigrants in California to appease the Japanese and keep our relations positive. So that wraps up this uh, this first wave of imperialism. Imperialism certainly doesn't stop with Teddy Roosevelt or anything that happened in this chapter. Uh, in fact, we'll see it continue under Taft, under Woodrow Wilson. Then in the 1920s, we'll pull back after we uh, uh, suffer losses in World War I. And then after World War II, we find ourselves in a new position to basically not be imperialist, but certainly be involved in other people's business around the world. And that is what will continue throughout modern time today. So this is the chapter on imperialism. Hope you learned a good bit. Have a great day.